Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. When we talk about behavior, we imagine that a degree of separation exists between our thoughts and our actions. As the saying goes, between mind and body, but this is incorrect. Just as a muscle integrates with fat and bone, our thoughts, themselves biological, fully integrate with our behaviors. In the Bible, there is no distinction between mind and body. Both are flesh. As such, biblical healing comes not from discussion, but through obedience. Like a chiropractor, the Lord's commandment corrects the position of your bone and your muscle falls in place. That's why the priority of biblical wisdom is to correct, protect, and direct your footsteps. If you can do what the Lord instructs you to do, the rest will take care of itself. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 23 to 25. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 242 of the Bible as Literature podcast. So today, Richard, we're going to wrap up chapter four of the gospel of matthew i'm excited because we're just turning the corner next week and beginning our discussion of what is traditionally called the sermon on the mount but we would be remiss if we didn't spend some time with verses 23 through 25 there's a lot of important information packed in this little section which seems like an epilogue or maybe a transitional section into the sermon on the mount but there's more going on here, isn't there? As we always say, Father, we have to follow the storyline. Don't forget, he already went out to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he went and found the disciples. They dropped their nets. They left their fishing. These pillars are now joining Jesus, and Jesus is going about his work. He's going about preaching. This is the beginning of his preaching. Now that John has gone, as we saw not too long ago, Jesus is picking up his own disciples. It's time for Jesus to start his own ministry. And when I say ministry, I'm not talking in abstract terms. It's time for him to teach. That's why he got disciples. Those are his first students. And interestingly, in the ancient world, a student was not there to receive a grade. A student was there to receive a teaching so that they then could become the teachers of this teaching. Jesus is already thinking about the next generation. As soon as you get a new job in management, you need to identify who your next successor is going to be. On Jesus' first day, he's already found his disciples, and it's time for him to start the business, and so he's going out to teach. Well, and if you think about this in terms of the Pharisaic movement of late antiquity, and this is something that's discussed in broader scholarship, this idea that the Pharisees were working to move the Torah out of the temple and into the synagogue. They were trying to take the community away from cultic religion towards a religion centered around the teaching, which is what scripture has been all about from the very beginning. It's not been about the cult. It's been about the teaching replacing the cult. Because the cult was there before the rise of Scripture. People always worship different statues and different deities and different kings. Well, here in this section of Matthew, now Jesus has begun his ministry, and he is taking the Torah to the synagogues in the region of Galilee and greater Syria. This is very powerful imagery. So remember, the expectation would have been that if you were going to teach Torah, you would be in the temple in Jerusalem, which is the center of everything, but that's not what Jesus is doing. He is taking the teaching out of Jerusalem into the synagogue in the wilderness. And the key here for our listeners is that this is much more radical in principle than you think it is. Even now, with fundamentalism and political Zionism, you have people trying to make the case in the Christian community that there needs to be a temple in Jerusalem. 
and they're committing all kinds of violence against the poor in order to fulfill a religious fundamentalist fantasy. But here in Matthew, we're being taught something different. You don't need Jerusalem. This isn't about the temple in Jerusalem. You don't need to have sacrifices. The only sacrifice you need is the sacrifice that is made personally when you pick up a copy of the Bible and you walk out into the wilderness and you start teaching people in the synagogue and beyond. It's a personal sacrifice of time and treasure. It has nothing to do with killing a bullock upon the altar. Because what God desires in Psalm 50 in the end is not your bullock slain on an altar. What he desires is a heart that has been broken and humbled. And that is the work that Jesus Christ is doing now. Right. I just was having this discussion over the weekend because we were talking about ancient Jewish religion. And I said, when are you talking about? Because by the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the members at the Qumran community already had rejected the temple. And they said that their community, they could teach just as well as anyone else. And then you had the Pharisees who were going out and teaching. And you had Jesus and his followers, as depicted in Scripture, going out and teaching to the masses. So the similarity between Qumran and the Pharisees is that they wanted to bring the teaching outside the temple. The difference is Qumran decided on creating a single community, it seems, at a single place, whereas the Pharisees went to many different locations, to all these different synagogues, and that was the point, is that the teaching would go out and out and out. Qumran was a closed community, whereas the Pharisaical movement was much more open to the extent that this movement that the New Testament depicts fits within that spectrum. The Pharisaic movement ultimately culminates in the movement of the writing of the New Testament. We've made that very clear. It's no small thing that Paul identifies himself as the Pharisee of Pharisees. And at the same time, not only Paul, but everyone who would have been part of this, quote, Pharisaic movement is presented at best as a compromise character, but most commonly in the story as the villain. The writers of Scripture present themselves as the villain because at the heart of the scriptural teaching is this important principle that it is the teaching that holds sway, not the teacher. That's the difference between the authority of Paul in the story of the New Testament or the authority of Jesus Christ. By what authority, they ask in Mark, do you teach? It's the authority of God's instruction, which is personal in the sense that it is the word of God, it comes from him, and you had better fear him. But the one who's announcing it to you is functional. They are just there to announce it. This point came up again on our Tuesday show this week with Father Paul, this example, you know, Richard, that I love, of the authority a child has in the assembly when they read the epistle. It could be a nine-year-old child, but if they read the letter of Paul correctly, that reading has authority. It does not matter even if the nine-year-old understands the reading. Because as Father Paul pointed out when we were discussing the Meskalim in the Old Testament, to meditate on the maskil, the wisdom, the knowledge, to meditate in Scripture. When you look at the etymology of the term in Hebrew, means literally to spell out the words. So the nine-year-old, when they read the epistle in church, is fulfilling the commandment to meditate on the Lord's precepts in the night watches. And this is very much understood in our liturgical tradition. This is what it means to meditate on the Lord's precepts, literally to spell them out, because the words themselves hold the authority, and that's the authority that Jesus is wielding here. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And much the same way that prosperity in Joshua isn't really about the acquisition of wealth, something you pointed out this week, Richard. Prosperity in Joshua is about the acquisition of the Lord's wisdom, his Torah. Being conversant in the Torah is to be prosperous in that sense in the eyes of God. It may be that that could lead to material wealth, but that's not the wealth we're talking about when we say prosperity in the Old Testament. Here, the same could be said of healing. We think about it in terms of being healed of an infirmity, but the real healing comes 
from, again, the wisdom of God which corrects your thoughts and controls your steps. That's the healing that takes place. Right, and we've talked a lot about the spirit because it's the spirit that motivates you. It's the spirit that moves you, just as the breath inside your body animates you and allows you to move around and be a living creature. It's this teaching that goes within you that creates the spirit within you. And I'm not talking spirit in the supernatural sense. I'm talking about the breath that animates us. When you have a good spirit, you do good things because your members are performing good actions. When you have a bad spirit, you're bad because your members are working according to that spirit. When you have a bad spirit, that's when you're sick. When you have a good spirit, that's when you're healthy. But how do you get a good or a bad spirit? It's when someone puts that spirit in you, whether good or bad. It's significant that among these things that are listed of what Jesus does, the first one is teaching, because it's the teaching that goes within them. Now, there is this competition among these different groups, like you brought up, Father, who has the correct teaching, who is teaching the scripture well. And it's interesting, you know, bringing up the Pharisees, because what we think of today as Jews, modern Jews, also trace themselves back to the Pharisees. The rabbis go back to the Pharisees. The Pharisees really did win the day, that it's about the teaching that goes out. That's why the Pharisees and Jesus have to have it out as far as the teaching. Jesus begins by teaching, and because of his teaching, then comes this healing. But the teaching has to come first. We always get excited about the healing. Oh, the healing proves that the teaching is correct. I don't know. Look, as a pastor, I have repeatedly seen how bad instruction, there is such a thing as wicked instruction. Wicked instruction produces mental illness of varying degrees in people. And not only have I seen this mental illness at work in people's lives, I've seen how a small amount of mental illness when someone is in their prime, if not corrected by proper instruction, scriptural instruction, turns into psychological neuroses by the time they're older. And I've seen how parents communicate these neuroses to their children. In Arabic, there's this expression about how faith is passed with the mother's milk. So is insanity. So is sin. So is mental illness. These are communicable diseases. So I think the metaphor of healing is on the mark in this regard because Wicked teaching is a very real thing. All of us are Platonists, so we are dualists. We think about our thoughts as being something different from our actions. And just by drawing that distinction, we already create problems for people. Scripture is very behavioral. How a person behaves is how they think. They're the same thing. And so the instruction of Scripture corrects your steps, which corrects your thoughts, which does cast out these types of illnesses. And the ultimate illness is selfishness and entitlement and self-righteousness. These are illnesses. These are corrosions on the human brain that destroy our brain pathways, which are at the same time our behaviors. There's no distinction. I mean, this dualism has to stop because it cripples our ability to both accept and apply wisdom in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, which is about changing how you act, changing where you walk. It's about obedience. If you begin where everybody begins with the long theoretical discussion about what are the real issues behind the real issues, all you're doing is taking somebody's money or at a minimum taking their time. And in either case, that makes you a thief. The news about him spread throughout all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And here I just want to say about these three types of illnesses, Richard, the demoniac is the one who's possessed by a wicked spirit, which is a spirit other than the spirit of righteousness, which scripture places in you. The epileptic is the one who loses control of their body, which means they are at the mercy of a wicked spirit. They can't control their steps at all. And a paralytic is someone who has an inability to take steps. So all of it is rooted in this wicked instruction. The one who is demon-possessed is possessed by a wicked spirit, as you outlined at the beginning, and they have no control over their actions or they have an inability to take action, to take steps. And so when Jesus preaches to these people, he heals them. He corrects and casts out the wicked spirit 
by replacing it with the spirit of God's instruction. I just heard a Russian priest this week on the internet say, you cannot receive the Holy Spirit if you're not reading Holy Scripture, and I wholeheartedly agree. And once you receive the Holy Spirit through the righteous instruction of Scripture, then suddenly your actions are under control. You are sane, and then you're able to move according to God's precepts and his commandments. The word for news or fame, it's akui, which is hearing. It's the hearing of him. So there's a play here because news is hearing, but hearing Jesus is not hearing the nightly news. It calls to mind again Galatians, where Paul was heard of in Jerusalem, but he wasn't there for them to see. There was no statue of Paul which is a way of saying that all you need to do is hear the instruction. So now in this example, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the one for whom the Apostle Paul prepares the way in the New Testament, this one is preaching and people are hearing, they're not seeing. One cannot stress this enough. Don't be fooled by your eyes. Your eyes lie to you. Not only do your eyes lie to you because of the human gift of assumption, but because they lie to you, It's very easy to fool you in the Photoshop era, (laughs) literally. So you have to always go back to what you hear. And in Scripture, what you hear is a euphemism for the facts of the text. But in life generally, if you apply this wisdom to any subject matter, it applies. Don't be fooled by what you see. Listen for the facts and analyze because your eyes are misleading you. We know from science that what you hear has one of the most important effects on the human body. Not just brain, on the body. How do we know this? Because there's this disparaging term that we use in medicine called the placebo effect, which means I can give you a pill made up of sugar and starch and say, this will allow your muscle pain to go away. And in a large percentage of adults, the pain will go away. What is acting on the muscle pain? The word of the doctor. It's only the word of the doctor. When the doctor states this will cure your pain, it goes away. If the doctor were to say nothing, it would not go away. Now, in medicine, we disparage this. We call this the placebo effect, and that means, oh, our medicine didn't do anything. But I was listening to one commentator who says, I'm a big fan of the placebo effect. It's very easy. And like you were saying, Father, a little bad teaching can leaven the lump of illness within the body and the mind. So let's not automatically say this is superstition, Because science itself has proven the placebo effect is a real thing and is, in fact, one of the most powerful medicines that human beings have ever known. Well, let me give an example of how dangerous wicked instruction is. It could be a parent is engaged in a destructive behavior and they are not self-critical or even self-aware of this destructive behavior. And it could be something very mundane. But they pass this behavior on and then it gets amplified and it causes all kinds of problems for their son or daughter. The same thing is true with the general teaching that's preached from the pulpit. So take, for example, what has happened in the United States with political Christianity. People love to talk about political Islam, but we have a problem internally, a very serious problem with political Christianity, both left and right, where they associate the righteousness of God's instruction with their desire to be right in the political arena. And they make out of their opinion about a social issue something of religious importance, of ultimate importance, as though that political issue pertains to the will of God in Scripture. And so you have now moral issues in our society that we're trying to solve in the courts, and people have assigned religious fervor to these issues to the extent that there's deep alienation in the country between different sides of the argument. And the Christians, above all others, bear the most responsibility for this rift in our culture because of political Christianity. That is an example of a wicked teaching, and it's more wicked than just run-of-the-mill ideology because run-of-the-mill ideology doesn't co-opt the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to further a worldly agenda. And Christian leaders have allowed this to happen across all the denominations because it's politically expedient, because there is an advantage to currying the favor of your political leaders. 
But God didn't send us here to take care of the political leaders and the lobbyists. He put us here to take care of the lost sheep. And we are so intent upon worldly glory masked as the will of God that we seek it at the expense of the most vulnerable sheep in God's flock. I gave an example at the outset of the podcast about how political Christianity in its embrace of Zionism results in suffering, but there are plenty of examples right at home. And the most important in my mind, Richard, is the way that people use the gospel now to sow discord, to sow division between brothers and sisters. They're building the wall of enmity that Paul is trying to tear down in Ephesians, and it's sickening. Just as bad teaching can bring about sickness, good teaching can bring about health. That's all we're saying. And we're giving as many examples as possible. How much do you have to read about Facebook to realize that people's lives are negatively affected if they're on Facebook too much? Why is this? Because Facebook has a teaching. And when it says, quote, their lives are more negative, unquote, what that means is that physically and mentally and spiritually, they are doing worse, which means sick. Malakia is the word in Greek that the text uses here. So realize that the teaching and the health are not separate, just as the mind and the body are not separate. Do not fall into this understanding that there is some kind of inherent distinction between the mind and the body, between teaching and health. They're all related to each other. And we're all related to each other. And that's what the teaching is telling us, and that's how it heals us. Notice how Christ is going to the outsider with the instruction in order to make out of the outsider a brother, and we Christians, in the name of our own glory and our own political objectives, are amplifying the division in the country, and we are using the flock of God to give fuel to this fire by co-opting their zeal for God and reassigning it to worldly things, which is, again, exactly what Paul criticizes in his letters. They have a kind of zeal, but it's corrupted. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. In other words, Richard, to your point about the healing, it is healing for everyone. If you're going to tear down the wall of enmity in the New Testament, you have to tear it down so that everyone, the Romans, notice the Romans counted in 10, and we have this famous Roman Decapolis, it has extra value as a metaphor for the entire Roman polity because it's the number 10 and the Romans counted in tens, right? So it's the Roman cities were added to the community of people who submit to the Torah. But it's the Decapolis, Richard, and Jerusalem, which means we're not leaving behind those who were first set up as an example of sin, as Paul says in Romans, meaning it's all men. It's all of the human race. It's not just Jerusalem. It's also Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So it's a way in a kind of literary flourish here to really emphasize that it's all encompassing. Jesus is going to the whole world with this instruction. Right. And the instruction has already made it out of where he is in the Galilee. He says he was teaching in Galilee, but the word was reaching everywhere, was reaching the whole world. And many crowds I think that's interesting. It's not a crowd, but many crowds were coming from all these different places. And like you said, you know, you have Galilee in the north, you have the Decapolis, you have Jerusalem, which is the place that Jesus has self-consciously not been to. And we have Judea, which is the entire region around Jerusalem, but then also beyond Jordan. That's where the original tribes who were forgotten were from, but that's also the area of the Syrian desert. You have the Gentiles and the shepherds all from that area. And it's also, let's not forget, the place where John was preaching. So the word from Galilee reached to the place where John originally was preaching beyond the Jordan, from where people had been gathered to hear John. Now they're ready to hear Jesus speaking about the kingdom, teaching about the kingdom, and bringing health because of his teaching about the kingdom. And that's exactly where we will pick up next week with the Sermon on the Mount. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. Just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.